For those who closely observe the world beyond our borders, last year was tumultuous and full of surprises. And before we get too far into this year, we wanted to look back and forward to signpost where the fault lines to come might be. To do that, as we've done for a number of years now, we welcome longtime Post Media foreign correspondent Matthew Fisher, just retired, to our studio. He is currently resident visiting scholar in defense and security at the Bill Graham Center for Contemporary International History and Massey College at the University of Toronto. And of course, there's our longtime TVO contributor, Janice Stein. She is founding director of the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy, the U of T well represented here on it our is. set today. Happy New Year, everybody. Happy Great to have Happy you New back Year. for our annual. Thank you. Janice, of course, lovely to have you here as well. How much of the world did you see this past year? Uh, I was asked by your producer, so I had to tote it up. It was 17 countries, I believe, uh, a lot in Africa, some Europe, uh, some Far East, and I did go to the Caribbean, but never got off the ship. It was a warship. And so I saw the Bahamas through the big binoculars up on, uh, uh, up on the deck. Okay. Janice? Uh, I didn't count, Steve, but I uh, went to Europe, Asia, uh, particularly East Asia right now, and a lot of travel in the Middle East. Okay. Point is, you've both been around a lot, yeah. so you're uniquely placed to answer this next question, which is, in terms of trends, what's the big 2018 headline for you, Matthew? China. 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 Uh, it has been for a number of years. I think Canada was one, um, one of the last places to really twig to how big China was in many different ways. We thought about it a lot in terms of trade, but not other things. The big headline for you for last year? Well, the, I agree uh, with Matthew. China's big, big story mm -hmm. and uh, still growing. But the second story uh, is the implosion of Europe. Uh, a Europe that is just turning inward, Steve, and navel-gazing um, and bereft of any kind of voice in the world. Hmm. Would you follow up on that and talk to us about how you perceive the state of liberal democracy in the world today? Boy, it's uh, in pretty bad shape just about everywhere. Uh, I'm not even convinced that it's uh, that healthy in Canada, although it's healthier in Canada, certainly, than it is in Europe. Uh, I've done a fair bit of traveling in the Baltic states and in... Poland uh, in the last year, and uh, uh, there is no faith in government, uh, no trust in democracy, and these movements that have simple solutions are just going berserk. I, I also spent time in Germany, and potentially that could be the worst problem five or ten years from now, maybe sooner, uh, because uh, Germany is fracturing politically. We're going to follow up on that in a bit. You say, you, maybe you're being a little bit facetious, but you said even in Canada you're not so sure how strong democracy is. I mean, all things being relative, and I don't want to sound smug here, but we're doing pretty well relative yeah, to the rest I, of the world, I, I think we? it's important to keep a sense of perspective right. here. Certainly we're doing well, and we have a thriving democracy in this country. And let me make a more controversial statement. The United States has a thriving democracy. Uh, it has a president that would like to undo all our international alliances and institutions. And we've been in this business now with Donald Trump for what is it now, Steve, two years. And you actually look at what he's managed to destabilize, not much. Hmm. So that tells us the courts in the United States are still working, Congress is still working, and will now be more invigorated. So let's not write off liberal democracy. Too well, just yet. Here. The test is going to be the Republicans, I think, in the next six yeah. months or a year. They seem to slowly be coming to the opinion that Trump maybe isn't very good. You want to know what you said about him last time you were here? Sheldon, if you would. Make one prediction about what's going to happen next year so that we can play the tape back next year when you come. The Donald Trump uh, will change the world very significantly, significantly and not necessarily for the worse. I think he's mo going to be more moderate in Russia or, or more tough on Russia uh, than he's saying. And on China, I think he's going to be very tough. Obama was a wonderful man. I, I like him very much, but he did none of that. It is a shame sort of how U.S. foreign policy has been conducted. I actually have some hope because of some of the people that he's put around him. How would you rate your powers of prognostication on that one? 
Well, maybe not as bad as you <laughs> might from that little clip. Well, the first part was right. Ch Trump did significantly change no, the world. No, he didn't. Uh, you don't think so? No, he Janice's did not. Janice's point is that he isn't, and I can see where she's coming from. But in terms of the, how the United States is regarded, he certainly yeah. changed that perspective. Tougher on Russia and China, though, than you no, thought? Uh, well, obviously, the Russia thing continues to unspool. Mm -hmm. And I, I just could not believe an American citizen, let alone a president, would be so deep implicated in the Russia stuff. On China, uh, it's a bit of a wash, but finally, I think on China, he is becoming tougher. And that was one of the points that Obama was very weak about. One of the things you said at the end of that prediction was you were heartened by the fact that he had good people around him who you thought would keep him in check. Those birds have flown. I was going to say, they've Those all left, you know. Those birds have flown. Uh, there's not one of them left. Right. Uh, they all left for, I'm pretty sure, the same reason. Which is what? They had no influence, and they couldn't stand him personally. And they were going to wear his stupidities. Well, it was uh, going to be uh, career in ending. Fact, <laughs> in fact, that has been the case. Let's move overseas. You both had some time in Europe this past year, and here's what you had to say about the EU last time you were here. Yes, please. The European project that I talked about in terms of failing, uh, it is closer to death this year than than last year. And uh, closer to death, or closer to the flu. No, death, 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 death. The end of the, the European the, Union. The end of the European Union. If a couple more of those countries bolt, what do you have? Matthew? Well, they're still uh, chastened. They're much chastened by what happened with Britain, but there's, without a doubt, still movements in Italy, uh, in Greece, uh, and in Eastern Europe that don't want to have much to do with the European project. Poland is one of the biggest examples. And uh, the EU has unraveled a lot. Uh, whether Brexit, who knows what's going to happen with Brexit now? Who knew even then what was eventually going to happen? But it, it has won warned some countries off separation. Do you think not the EU is, as he suggests, closer to death today than no. it was a year ago? No, and I, I do not. I, I have no doubt that the EU will survive. What will not happen, and that's obvious, Steve, is that next stage of integration that some Europeans had hoped for, where there would be, as we have in Canada, transfer payments from the rich to the poor, which is the way successful federations deal with trade imbalances, mm -hmm. when you can't manipulate your currency. That's not going to happen in Europe. And probably what the EU will look like a decade from now is this very loose federation of European states. But the EU will survive. Does it need a... You know, Angela Merkel, of course, of Germany, has been the sort of de facto leader of the EU. Right. For, you know, for many, many years now. And she's about to leave. She is. What kind of a vacuum does that leave and who can fill it? You know, that's the, the sobering part of the European story. Uh, if we focus on France and Germany, which are the, the, the core alliance that has driven the European forward. You know, Angela Merkel were in this long transition in Germany. There is a successor, but it's not clear when Angela Merkel goes. Actually, not great uh, in politics, as you know well, Steve. Uh, and it's a two-year-long goodbye. It's a very long <laughs> goodbye in <laughs> politics. And in France, uh, the vest jaune, the yellow vesters, are on the streets in a, in a relatively serious challenge to Macron. Uh, so it's, you know, France is turning inward, Germany is turning inward, uh, and that capacity to lead the European Union, there's a big vacuum right now. What do you well, see on that? That is why I would say that the European Union remains in very deep trouble. If you don't have strong German or French leadership, particularly German leadership, I think you get into big trouble in a hurry. And uh, Merkel was, in my opinion, an exceptional a woman, an exceptional politician, in holding all of that together. Because in Germany itself, there have been these undercurrents of right-wing politics in Germany and Bavaria, for example, for a very long time. She kept that house somehow in order. And also, in terms of money, transfer of payments, Germany, uh, uh, effectively, de facto, has been transferring money to those other countries for a long time. That's actually not true. The Germans benefited. There's huge economic yeah, benefit. Markets for their 
products. Oh, it's unbelievable. Germany is the biggest financial winner in the European Union and led this austerity program, which actually pushed the weaker ones under the bus. I think Mm. history is going to rewrite Angela Merkel's record. But Mm. why did I say the European Union will survive? They're going to muddle through. Last word on this? I think we pay far too much attention to Europe, even though we don't pay much attention to Europe. That's not where the game's being played. I don't think Canada should be spending uh, much energy on Europe at all. To me, Europe... Europeans hate this when you say it, but... It's passé. The door's closed. Those who are smart and young will emigrate to Canada. A heck of a lot of young French people are emigrating to Quebec right now. Uh, And I get a sense of despair from young people uh, in Spain and Italy. And that is what they tell me, that they lack any hope whatsoever. Right, no, I don't unemployment think rates are 25 to 50 percent. Yeah. And yeah. so, okay, come, let's, come you to wanna, Canada. You want to go where the action is? You were in the South China Sea this past year. Yeah. Uh, How I, come? Well, I go there because I'm very interested in what China is up to. Uh, I was there uh, this time on a cruise ship. The previous time I'd been there, uh, which wasn't long before, was on a warship, the Canadian warships, and I think it shows how Canada is an outlier with its allies. We avoided at all cost going anywhere near those Chinese artificial islands in the South China Sea. Our our, uh, warships were kept hundreds of miles away while Britain, France, Australia, uh, and of course the United States conducted all kinds of freedom uh, of naval... uh, Military uh, maneuvers and so on. Maneuvers all all around. And uh, Canada was outside of all of that. Also, the. the Chinese are very interested in what everybody's doing. Their spy ships, it reminds me of what used to happen in Europe years ago. The Chinese spy ships follow everything, everywhere. And I flew last year. The most interesting thing I did last year was a flight nonstop from San Francisco or from Singapore to San Francisco, and we flew right over one of the Spratly Islands. And out the window, looking down, you could see, and I got reasonable pictures of it that I can show you, uh, 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 the artificial uh, island with the airfield with all the okay. radar. Which going. raises so the I'm question. So I'm going to say, ahead. so what? You're going to say, so what? So what? So what? So Most the South China Sea, it is not. The South China Sea is in China's backyard. It's like the Caribbean for the United States. Why are we picking this as a fight? Uh, China is projecting its power in its own region, in its backyard. It is a problem for Japan and Vietnam and, of course, for Taiwan. Uh, but this is not a global problem, contrary to all the hype around it. I think Canada's perfectly sensible to keep its warships out of there. There's no value add. We're not going to make a tiny bit of difference by doing that. And let's lower the temperature here. This is a regional problem in East Asia. So the great question, of course, many people who do what you do for a living are asking is, is China a potential military threat or are they more likely a significant economic competitor? Yeah, I think, Which well, is I think when we... Talk about China as a military threat, we're missing the story. The real story about China over this next decade, it will be a significant economic and, most importantly, technological competitor. Uh, and we're, we're actually in the middle of this in our country right now because we are having a very inflamed discussion about Huawei. Mm-hmm. Huawei um, is a leading technology company because it provides state of the art technology and its 5G platform at lower cost. But there is no trust that the Chinese government will not use Huawei as an instrument of its foreign policy and to spy. Mm -hmm. That's the story about China. It's not what it's doing. Uh, I I think that everything Janice has said is true, plus... China is on an unprecedented campaign to build aircraft carriers, all kinds of submarines. It's pushing out beyond the South China Sea, where it's not just a question of uh, a regional event. They've claimed 90% of the world's uh, busiest sea. The United States does not do this in the Caribbean. It does not try to uh, in they any way... They've never had bases? Uh, th- they've had a base mm-hmm. in, in the Caribbean, mm-hmm. uh, in, in Cuba today, but Guantanamo it's... Guantanamo Bay, yes, hello. But it yeah. is, yes, but it is not a strategic base. Oh. There are no fighter jets there. There are no missiles based it had, there. It, had, it ringed the world with bases. Let's the United be States rings the world with bases, sure. Yeah. And, and now, when you go to Djibouti, the Chinese are there. The That's Chinese 
Japanese have been in the Baltic Sea with their warships. They've been in the Mediterranean. They're becoming a blue water navy. But and what, anybody who does new, not, Matthew? they have copied. Uh, this is totally new development that they have the intellectual property. They stole all the plans for the F-35, uh, their J-20 fighter, the stealth jet. But are these uh, acts of war? Should we no. consider these? They will these, be acts of war at one point. So this it, is a tremendous flashpoint going forward because China will not be just satisfied with the South China Sea. They're already conducting naval operations out into the Indian Ocean and projecting right into the Middle East. Last so, word on China. Yeah, so let's just say the United States did everything that Matthew described China doing for a very, very long time. We did not describe that behavior as warlike or as aggressive. Because they're a democracy and they're our friends. You no, know, it's because they're our friends. Okay. Uh, and we like them, and we trust but them. But we did often describe them that way. A lot of Canadians did. Uh, they mentioned the number of bases the U.S. Okay, okay. moving on, moving okay. on. You said Canadians, and that's where I want to go next, our home and native land. Sheldon, would you please bring this up from Maclean's magazine? While democracy is in global decline, Canadian institutions are holding up. That makes us resilient. Authoritarianism is on the march globally, including in the United States and Europe, but Canada remains unbowed. Traditional allies are squabbling, and Europe is talking about raising a standing army to counter Russia and the United States. But this constitutional monarchy and parliamentary democracy maintains stable, often fond, working relationships most of the world over. In 2019, Canada is positioned to start down a path towards leading the world. What say you? A lot of hype there. Mm. <laughs> Too much? Oh, oh yeah. Canada oh, yeah. patting itself on its back. Well, look, we have lots to be proud of it, right? We have a stable democracy. We're managing, we all, and we've done this for a long time, immigration, uh, better than almost any developed democracy that I know. So we have a lot, and we have a civil discourse. Uh, still in this country, although... Most around, of the time. Most of the time, all around the edges, we're certainly hearing stuff. But let, we have to be realistic about who we are. We are a small country. Uh, we, we live next door to the United States. That's our geography and it's our destiny. Mm -hmm. And we will always have to pay extraordinary attention to the United States. And we only have so many degrees of freedom. What we've done, when we've thrived in the past, Steve, is if we picked one or two issues where there is, we see an opportunity to build uh, an alliance, and we punched above our weight uh, a few times. Landmines. Yeah, we did that. You know, looking forward, and there are Canadians discussing this right now, uh, is there an opportunity to lead on digital governance, for instance, uh, which is going to be the issue uh, of the global economy over the next 10 years? We have Canadians, like Mark Carney, uh, and others around the world. Governor of the Bank of England. Governor of the Bank of England, but more equally important, who set up the International Financial Stability Board. So mm -hmm. leading, but very strategic, very selective. Canadians need to remember we're a small country, oh. and so we need to deploy our influence <laughs> where it matters. Where it matters. Uh, Matthew, look, at, I don't know this, I haven't got a poll, but my hunch is the current prime minister of the country is the most famous Canadian in the world today. Having said that, in your travels, what do you hear people saying about RPM? Well, very little, first of all. But young I, people I, love them. I don't, don't see that at all. I see I that do. progressive movements and journalists in Western Europe celebrate him as their champion. Yeah. So he gets an extremely favorable press in some sectors in Western Europe. He certainly doesn't get a favorable press in the business press in Europe or anywhere else, but, but there. But I don't, I think we oversell the idea, as we did with his father, that somehow he, he was a force. I am reminded of what an American woman who worked for uh, uh, um, President Obama told me. Uh, she said to me, she's always amazed at how can Canadians talk on the one hand about what a small country they are, and they can't really do this or they can't do that, so they will only do niche things. And yet, but on the other hand, they boast about having one of the world's most dynamic economies, one of the seven or eight biggest economies in the world. You can't, she says, and I think she's right, have it both ways. Canada has all kinds of global responsibilities that it runs away with, it runs away from. from all the time by claiming that it's a small country on the one hand, well, in fact, we're not such a small country. Well, I don't agree with my friends here. Uh, first of all, actually, it's interesting because when I travel, I'm often in universities. 
uh, which is where I go. And young people are always asking me about the prime minister. So there is still uh, a kind of... There's a generational uh, thing that there's he, a generational he has that appeal. generational thing. That's exactly right, uh, which is undeniable. Uh, but secondly, we can be a small country with a dynamic economy. You know, Ericsson right now, uh, Nordic company, is second to Huawei as a supplier of 5G technology. There's nothing inconsistent about being small and dynamic. And I would add one thing more, strategic. There's no military asset that we have in this country, and we haven't had one since World War II, where we've really made a difference to a battle outcome. We contribute our assets. First Gulf War, early 90s? Nah, we no. didn't make a difference no, to the outcome. No, no way. So why do we contribute our assets? In solidarity with our allies. Hmm. That's what it's about. Okay, next subject for discussion, as the Beatles would say, we're going to go back in the U.S., back in the U.S., back in the USSR. Oh, yeah. You, oh, you, oh, you yeah. were, uh, yeah, of course, which doesn't exist anymore, but that's just so we can put a fancy banner at the bottom of the TV set right now. You were... Uh, you were in northern Norway this year, were you not? I was on the, the you big NATO exercise. Uh, it was very curious. The trip was sponsored by the U.S. State Department at a time <laughs> when the president... Uh, this is an example of how there's pushback from parts of the U.S. government. The president was saying one thing about NATO, and at the same time, the State Department was sponsoring journalists to go there. I was the only Canadian, but there were journalists from all kinds of countries who went on this trip and had unbelievable access, not only to the U.S. military machine that was there, but uh, everyone else. It was a big exercise, much smaller than what the Russians did earlier in the year with Vostok, which was 300,000 troops, mm -hmm. but still it was 50,000. And I think the most interesting thing all year that Canada did militarily, because Canada actually did contribute quite a lot. We had uh, four warships there. We had... Uh, uh, fighter jets, we had refueling tankers, we had a battalion of the Vandus there, mm -hmm. and uh, the whole idea was to stop Russia, and the comical aspect was every single person who spoke said, oh, this is just an exercise, it has nothing to do with any one country. Well, you don't go to northern Norway, where it was cold as hell already in October, uh, to practice war unless there's a good reason, okay, here's and the my, reason is Russia. Here's my question for Janice. There's apparently, I haven't seen the show, but there's a Nordic TV show called Occupied, where the Russians apparently slowly begin to occupy Norway. Are the Scandinavian countries really nervous about yeah, that potential? I, yeah, I, I think we have to take that seriously. It, you know, who's most worried in Europe right now? Uh, the Scandinavians, surpassed by the Baltics, mm -hmm. who are absolutely fixated on the possibility that Russia will break out. And then, of course, Ukraine and those on the, on the border of the United States. Uh, you know, Russia's led by a thug bully. <laughs> I don't know which word is the better one you pick, uh, Vladimir Putin, uh, who's really skilled, um, not at using his military, but at use his official military, but at using covert forces, engages in hybrid warfare, disrupts elections. You know, Michael Bloomberg was in town this week and said the issue, the threat that he takes most seriously uh, is the Russian attempts to disrupt elections in the United States, because that is such a fundamental part of U.S. democracy. Even the Minister of Democratic Institutions in Canada yes. said she couldn't guarantee that the Russians That's wouldn't have right. access at us. That's right. So in the middle of that, NATO really matters, mm -hmm. and it matters because it is, as I said, an alliance of solidarity. Mm -hmm. The New York Times ran the most incredible story to me this just a couple of days ago in which they described how Donald Trump returns again and again to the theme, let's withdraw from NATO. Hmm. And his generals have talked him out of it several times. That group no, is and, gone now. But just the fact that the president of the United States... Doesn't see the value in NATO. Doesn't see the value no. and no. speculates on withdrawing is chilling to those Nordics and the Baltics and those who live on the... Okay, let me go Russia. to... Because I don't want to get run out of time here without getting a couple more things in. Defeating Desh as Islamic State is sometimes called. That's our next issue. Let's go to the Middle East. How, how much of a threat do you think IS still poses? 
Well, it's, it is a brand, but in fact, there are many components to it and many components outside of it which are uh, uh, equally lethal. We, we've seen that with a, a series of attacks in Kenya uh, and all over Western uh, Africa. Uh, the Canadian military has said this week that the security situation in Mali is worse mm -hmm. than when they arrived there. It's deteriorating. And so... Islamic State is just a name, but it's actually a smorgasbord of names. There are 30 or 40 different groups. They all have slightly different mm -hmm. doctrines and whatnot. But, but they the do... basic thing is they don't like us, mm -hmm. and they are fomenting all kinds of revolution in places and trying to impose governments that definitely will not do anything in well, our favor. Was President Trump right or wrong when he said, essentially, they've been defeated? No. He's, no, he's not right. Um, but again... That is not a mortal threat. Not an existential threat. No, to the world. Um, they don't like us, but actually they don't like a lot of governments in the Middle East mm -hmm. and the Africa and Africa much more than they don't like us. Their range is much narrower. There's always a risk of lone wolf terror acts. We, we have to live with it like other societies mm -hmm. in the world do. It's serious but it's not existing. Well, okay. the potential for mayhem is, is still think... great in Europe. It could change governments to become less um, progressive, yeah. more populist. It's yeah. about the reaction yeah. uh, to them. With just a couple of minutes left to go here, let's have one prediction from each of you on something that's going to transpire in 2019 that you will not be embarrassed to see played back to you 12 months from now. Go ahead, Janice. Okay. One among two or three, there are European parliamentary elections in May. How well Steve Bannon's bloc does, uh, populist movement, how, what proportion of, and you know, this is like by election, Steve. It's a free vote. You don't have to be responsible for the consequences. Mm -hmm. This will be a really interesting barometer of how strong the populist anti European forces are in the EU. And what do you predict? Well, if they get 30, 35% of the seats, that's a serious issue for Europe. Matthew. I agree with Janice that that can be an issue, but of course I think more will be at play in Asia. And uh, there's the tremendous militarization of Asia that nobody here really knows too much about. Japan is spending gazillions, it's getting aircraft carriers, it's just ordered another hundred... Uh, Stop filibustering, I want your prediction. It, it will be some kind of standoff in Asia in the next year that could involve uh, the that's Japanese and the China. Come on, that's too A much A standoff space. in Asia between... Between China and its neighbors or the United States, and it could be over those islands. That it, could go whether, military. Yes, whether it's in the next 12 months or 24 or 36 months, it is coming like a freight train, and I think we are unwise to not think about that. Ten seconds to each of you on one good thing that happened in 2018 that we can end this segment on a high note with. You go first. Okay, Matthew, go ahead. <laughs> Good things are, are, are for me, uh, very hard to find. Uh, the, the, the domestic one, uh, which is related to the world, I think is that Canada did act quickly to accept this Saudi woman. Now, I know all the arguments about whether jumping the queue and all that, but I think there was a case to be made there. I think she would have ended up in Australia eventually, but it shows that Canada is prepared to act. Now, I don't agree with how it was handled politically at all in terms of the PR around it. But the, the country but, got but some it good was, PR. But it, it. but it was it, it was a feel-good story, and uh, and I know that Janice uh, uh, half agrees with you. You know what? He's so, an excellent foreign correspondent, but he but he certainly doesn't know how long 10 seconds is. No, Go ahead, Janice. Here's a good one. <laughs> An autonomous border zone is established uh, south of Turkey in the northern part of Syria, which finally gives the Kurds some piece of territory that it manages and some minimal sense of security. On that note of optimism, I'm getting out of here. Matthew Fisher, Janice Stein, great having you back pleasure. in our studio Thank as always. Thank you very much. A pleasure. The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.